Uh, my name is Matthew Heineman. I'm the director of The First Wave. That is a trailer from the National Geographic documentary, The First Wave. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my honor to welcome Academy Award-nominated and Emmy-winning filmmaker Matthew Heineman, director and producer of the Nat Geo documentary, The First Wave. The film captures the harrowing first four months of the COVID-19 pandemic as it played out in one of New York City's hardest-hit hospital systems. Matthew and his team embedded with the doctors, nurses, and patients on the front lines, battling the biggest crisis to hit the world in our lifetimes. Their incredible film testifies to the strength of the human spirit. But come and find out for yourself as we talk with Matthew Heineman. Matthew, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Uh, good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. The, the film is uh, The First Wave, uh, a National Geographic doc released theatrically by Neon and uh, now uh, available on Disney+. Plus. So uh, congratulations. Uh, what an incredible film, but I imagine I'm not the first person to tell you this. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, but for those of our listeners and, and viewers who haven't had a chance to uh, see this uh, powerful film yet, uh, maybe give us a little synopsis of what is the, what is the first wave all about. It is an uh, examination of the first four months uh, of COVID um, th- seen through the prism of a brave group of doctors, nurses, and patients uh, here in New York um, at a hospital in, in Queens. Okay. And um, I think now usually on this show, we often, the first part of the podcast is often spent talking about the, the fi- well, we will be talking about the film, obviously, but um, about characters and Sometimes we're uh, sometimes they're biopics, or sometimes they're people that subjects people that aren't well known. But uh, I, I think this will be the first time. I can't imagine there's been a subject where uh, I can't imagine we have anyone in our audience who hasn't been obviously affected or impacted by um, by the pandemic and COVID. And we will be talking about the uh, the, the incredible people that you uh, that you uh, bring to uh, to our attention in this film, but. Uh, in a in a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you. I mean, um, it's quite incredible how this project come about. I mean, obviously you had to you reacted very quickly uh, because you're there at almost from the beginning uh, there in the in the hospitals in that that particular hospital system in New York. Yeah, I mean, I I think I sort of woke up in early March and you know saw the tsunami that was about to sweep across us and just felt this enormous obligation to take this issue that was so relegated to stats and headlines and yeah. misinformation and try to humanize it, to try to put a human face to it. Yeah. We reached out to hospitals all across the country to get access and had a very hard time, you know, basically got rejected everywhere and then finally got access to a hospital here in New York and in Queens. Um, and, you know, I think, Another factor here was I was just really disgusted about how politicized and polarized this issue was mm. becoming even in those early days. And, and I think a huge part of that is that we, as an American public, were so shielded from the realities of, mm. of, of what was happening. Um, you know, there's a reason that journalism exists. There's a reason why mm. journalists go to war zones. And, and this, this issue is obviously talked about in, in wartime terms, front lines, doctors on the front lines, yep. the front lines. And so, you know, when you look back at Vietnam, when you look at Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, these images that came from there mm. form public discourse and form public opinion. And without that, in the case of COVID, um, we were so misinformed. And, and, and I think that's a big reason why it became so politicized and why misinformation uh, mm-hmm. with allowed to fester. And so that's another big reason why I and we felt this huge obligation and, and importance yeah. of telling the story in the way that we told it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite incredible because as you say, it was just a wave of 
misinformation, but we just had waves of, inf- of we no one knew what to believe, I think, in those early days, in many cases. And I, um, this is a UK-based podcast, but I was in the States, actually. I uh, flew in on early March and flew out in sort of late March, was probably on one of the last flights out. But uh, you're right, you remind me, something, the things I forget. I mean, I was even with my parents for part of that, given the various sources they listen to or watch and things like that. You just... Uh, it was all over the place. Um, so quite prescient of, well, you were seeing this, but also to know that there was something that needed to be, um, um, you know, to get, to get through the haze, I guess, of, of, this, of this misinformation is uh, quite incredible. I mean, you said you called around and finally, but I mean, that, uh, no hospitals. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of documentarians were trying to gain access and very, you know, you're one of the few that managed this. Um, why did that particular health care system say yes to you? Because everyone else was saying no. Um, I think a variety of reasons. Uh, yeah. I made a film uh, about a decade ago um, about our healthcare system called Escape Fire, the Fight to Rescue American Healthcare. Yeah. Uh, one of the main subjects in that film was Dr. Don Berwick, the former head of Medicare and Medicaid under Obama. Mm. And I reached out to him as I was sort of grasping at straws and, and trying to yeah. get access. And, um, you know, he, he reached out to the head of Northwell, the largest healthcare system in New York, where we ended yeah. up getting access and, you know, vouched for me, said that I was a decent human being. And um, <laughs> it was really that, that yeah. you know, that introduction that yeah. um, helped, helped open the door. But, you know, trust and access is, is earned, not given. Right. And, Obviously, we had to then have you know many deep, you know, intimate conversations with their leadership um, to make them comfortable with this process. Because heretofore, at that point, other hospital systems mainly said no, but some said yes. But you can you know you can talk to doctors on Zoom right. after the day of work, which is right. just right. not how I how I how I make films and how I wanted to make this film. Yeah. And so I could walk. Northwell and their leadership through my process, and and you know, I owe so much to them for having the courage to let us in in the way they let us in. No, I I completely agree. And um, uh, but what did you? So what, what did you? I mean, it sounds like an obvious question, but what it was? What did you find as you started to film? Did you have any idea what you, you, it was going to be like? I mean, you obviously had this previous healthcare uh, doc you did, but. Um, and, and you document things that even to this day, mo- most of us are unaware of in terms of what people went through, either the, the frontline workers or the, or the patients and families themselves. So, sorry. So what was, uh, I mean, what, did you have any idea, did you, what you found when you started, were you, ex- did you have any idea that this is what you were going to find when you started filming? Uh, you know, the the extent i mean everyone was in the in the dark in terms of what covid was and how it was affecting us no i mean we had absolutely no clue where this was all going to go i think we not naively thought that this would last one or two weeks and then yeah. it would be all over and so we're filming you know 16 18 hours a day in those early early stages and obviously it continued for weeks and then months and right oh. and we're still living with it today um, so again, we had no idea where this story was going to go. And that's one of the things I love about making docs is yeah. it's not, you know, scripting things and not, you know, um, preordaining where you think this is going to go, but letting the story and letting your subjects in the film, you know, lead you. When I, when I was 21 years old, um, a mentor of mine said, uh, someone that I looked up to said, if you, if you end up with the, with the story you started with, and you weren't listening along the way, right. which is which is good advice for life. And it's yes. good advice for, for filmmaking. Is you know be open to the story changing, uh, and that's something that I've held near and dear to my heart at every step along the way. My career, both in a macro sense, in terms of the films that I decide to make and, and where I where I go, but also in a micro mm-hmm. sense within each film and then within each shoot day. You know, mm-hmm. like just dance with the realities of life mm. um, and, and film, every single film has sort of played out in that way. 
um, where I end up with a, a much different film in the end than I thought I was going to make in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Well, and and uh, on that point, I mean, your docs are very character driven. I mean, self self described as character driven cinema verite. I mean, how did you manage? Because you obviously have to connect with your with your characters. Um, and you had a very short period of time with which to do that, to identify who are the main characters you're going to be following. Um, and how did you power, you know, you've forged such powerful relationships, at least professionally in this, in this regard, with these characters as, because you're, 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 you're focusing in right at the beginning with them. Uh, whereas I gather, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, I gather with some projects you would usually have a little more time with with the subjects before you really are getting to the to the body and and, and meat of the of the work is that is that a fair f- fair description or a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think generally I, I like once I get access to whatever story it is, I like to shoot right away. And I think those yeah. those early those first couple of days of shooting always dictate the sort of the tenor of, yeah. of the relationship between your subjects and, and the camera. Mm. Um, so I generally like to roll as fast as possible um, because, you know, becoming part of the fabric of the daily lives of your subject is, is key. And, and that's what allows you to get this type of access and, 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 and intimacy with your, with your subjects. And so um, the stakes here could not have been higher. I mean, the, right, right. the people that we were filming with were either on, on the healthcare side dealing with the razor thin edge between life and death and trying to keep people alive. And, and then on the patient side, you know, on that, on that razor thin line constantly. And, and so, you know, the fact that they were open to being filmed at the most difficult moments in their lives, um, I owe and we owe so much to them yeah. for, mm-hmm. for, the, for the courage to allow us in. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's a very good, important point. I mean, these uh, these are some incredible. Um, well, there's everyone in the in the film, but particularly uh, what I guess we could call the main characters. But um, I mean, Doctor uh, Natalie Duje. I mean, that's she's absolutely amazing. Um, the Ellis family, um, Brussels. Uh, how do you say her name? Jabon. Um, Jabon. Jabon and her, you know, her family and what they've been through. Kelly Wunsch, uh, Carl Rabian. I mean, they're all just, um, um, just so open with their, with their lives and their emotions, uh, going through this. It's, um, um, it's, it's, it's quite, quite incredible. And did you, I mean, they were, I mean, from, from the beginning, they were, they were, they were, um, I hate to put it this way. I don't know how to best put it, but they were, they were very open with you from the very beginning because this is right, right in March when this is all hitting. This is absolutely uh, uh, amazing what you've been able to uh, to document through their through their lives. Yeah, I mean, the the rules initially with the hospital is that we you know we could only focus on on healthcare workers. Um, so for the first week or so, we we really filmed with. Uh, that's when we met Dr. Duje. Yeah, um, and then eventually met Kelly, but I think it was after about a week or so that that you know we showed that we were filming with integrity and honesty, hopefully, right. and, right. and we had a very very small footprint. You know, we had two person teams. Often it was just a camera in the room, and so then we were sort of given the green light to start talking to patients and their families, and that's when we met uh, Ahmed and, and Brussels and and started tracking their things uh, with them in the hospital and with their families outside the hospital. Okay. Um, and um, I guess, I mean, you, you have a, a, you obviously have, you know, there's this way to tell this story. Uh, was there ever, <laughs> did you ever feel like you were going to have to tell this in a different way than you, you told it? I mean, imagine this is just all very heady you were in the middle of all this so you're it's very heady stuff in terms of trying to know you know like you said you don't know the ending but not even knowing the middle or barely knowing the beginning um yeah we knew we knew nothing we knew we had no idea where this is yeah, all going. yeah. Um, 
And if you told me in early March that this film would include protests about systemic racism, you know, months later, I would say, you know, I don't know that that's not part yeah. of, that doesn't make any sense, but that's exactly the story we ended up telling. Yeah. Is it wasn't all integrally tied together? We'll be back, right back with Matthew Heineman, the director of The First Wave, released theatrically by Neon. It's uh, had its broadcast debut. You can find it in Hulu in the States, um, also on Disney Plus here in the UK, and I know it's been released internationally. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning director Matthew Heineman. Uh, His film is The First Wave. Uh, It's been released theatrically. Uh, It's also had its uh, broadcast debut uh, internationally. Um, As we were talking before the break, Matthew, um, this, uh, like all great docs, it's got many storylines, and it's certainly not just about COVID-19. And uh, going in, you certainly did not expect to know that you were going to be capturing uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests and... uh, um, all these sort of forces that, um, well, I shouldn't say unleashed by the pandemic, but the pandemic sort of accelerates trends and movements and things like that. Uh, but you, I mean, you had no inkling this was about to happen. Um, and you're following uh, Dr. Duge, um, is obviously, um, and is that something that uh, she, obviously she f- felt very strongly, and you're capturing a lot of things uh, related to it, in your filming, even in the hospitals. Um, that was just a natural um, uh, pivot on your part, wasn't it? I mean, you just, these things started happening and you the you follow the story. Yeah, I mean, you didn't need to be a researcher or an epidemiologist or a scientist nah. to yeah. see what was happening. You just needed to walk through the, the you know hallways of an ICU um, in the hospital to see that this disease was disproportionately impacting people of color. Yeah. Um, it was very vivid, it was very clear. And so it wasn't really a question of if we were going to include that in the film, it was a question of how, and it all just came out naturally. We yeah. followed various participants in the film. And, and then you know, when George Floyd was killed and we had this sort of reckoning over systemic racism uh, in our country and, and frankly around the world, um, yeah that was obviously intricately tied to this disproportionate impact. And, and again, we just followed where the story took us and, and we followed Dr. Duge out into the streets. Yeah, and there's some incredible scenes there as well. Um, I think, um, uh, and your film also documents this toil that's taken on healthcare rec- workers and families too, and there's these many heartbreaking scenes, but um, as filmmakers, um, uh, I mean, how did you and the crew cope with this? Because you're 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 being confronted with, uh, besides these uplifting stories that you do document, you know, very heartbreaking stories all at this at the same time. Did that did that take a toll on you and your uh, and your team? Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely the hardest film I ever made. Um, you know, I've been in war zones around the world and I've told difficult stories, um, by far the hardest. When, when you're in a war zone, there's sort of spurts of terror and, 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 and danger, and, um, but there's a lot of boredom too. Uh, and then when you come home, you can sort of separate your brain a bit from all that is happening. With the first wave and making the first wave, you know, we're living the same thing that we're documenting. Um, it was a very, very full-on experience for a long period of time. You could never turn off. Um, and that was hard, you know? All the things you take for granted in making documentary, putting a lav mic on someone's shirt, yeah. putting the camera down on a table, eating, going to the bathroom, breathing. These are all ways to get the virus. These are all ways to spread the virus. And so... You know, you always had to be vigilant. You could never stop being vigilant. You could never turn off. And so that definitely took a toll over, over time. Um, but I think 
and I can speak on behalf of the amazing team that worked on this as well as myself, we were deeply inspired by what we were seeing every day, mm. despite the horror of it all, despite the sadness, despite the death. Um, I think we were, we were inspired by the, the wonderful acts of humanity and love and mm. care and, and courage and fortitude that we witnessed mm. day in, day out. And so I didn't go to bed at night feeling sad about the state of the world, despite the fact that there was a lot to be sad and scared about. Right. Um, I went to bed at night feeling really inspired um, by what, what we were witnessing. And I think if I was going to distill the film down to one thing, it's about how human beings come together in the face of crisis. And that was a really beautiful thing to witness. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess the, uh, uh, indeed, and also, you know, this is something that we're continuing to witness, isn't it? I mean, here we are, we've now been through a, a few variants, even, even way back when you're, some of the people in the film are talking about second and third waves likely to come and they have indeed come and gone and now we've got potentially another one um so this is something this is uh, you know this is a story that's still playing out um and uh you know i know you'd say you know you went in terms of the legacy of this film you would want it to the film speaks for itself but what are the what lessons do you want us to learn from this film that uh about this virus and issues that we are still fighting now? Uh, I guess on one basic level that this is real, um, yeah. despite the fact that, that many people <laughs> don't believe it's real. Um, again, it just so sad to me how polarized this issue's become um, and, and how it's really a disease, excuse me, a, a virus, a pandemic of, of, of the unvaccinated at this point. And, and both globally, mm. the disparities with which vaccines have been disseminated. And then exactly. with, with also within our own country of, of just the misinformation and, and the echo chambers that we, we all live in. Um, and the fact that predominantly those who are dying in hospitals in the US at least um, are, are the unvaccinated. Um, yeah. And so I, I hope that this film not only shows the realities in an apolitical way. There's no Trump in my film. There's no Dr. Fauci. There's, you know, no. I really tried to take away the politics and just show the human beings at the center of it and, and how they were affected and, and the realities of all that. Um, so I hope that the film can provide a, a vehicle through which we can reflect on all that we've been through. Mm. Um, and what have we learned? Mm. What have we learned as, as a society? What have we learned as individuals? Um, and how can we apply that knowledge to where we are now and, and where, we, where we go in the future? Yeah, well, I think that's a, I think that's a very good point. And even someone like, uh, I will say, dare say, even someone like myself now, uh, more than a year and a half, almost two years on with vaccinations and now boosters and stuff, we kind of lose sight of, um, of not only what those early days were like, but what things are still like in many parts of the world, as I think you rightly point out, there is quite a uh, disparity in terms of the vaccine equality uh, between the certainly the developed world and the rest of the world for the most part. Um, um, one that would probably never, that gap's never going to, unfortunately, it doesn't, it's not in the short term, it's going to be uh, narrowed. Um, and uh, people I know in all parts of the world say that, that they they don't even know how they would deal with another wave uh, at this stage. Um, and I but think, I think uh, go ahead. So, sorry to interrupt, but that, that's, that's human nature. You know, yeah. we all want to move on. You know, we all want to yeah. think about this thing, but we can't, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're all still living with it, whether we like it or not. And, and I think it's an important thing to, to see. And that's what I hope that this film can do is, is, is remind people the realities of how this affects you know, uh, families, communities, individuals. Mm. And well, I, I, I hope I, I, I know if anyone sees it, they, they will, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it certainly does that. And as, as you said, it's, uh, and you have to say this cause of being in the, in the U S but it is not politicized. It is a, it's in my ham fisted way of putting it. It's a very, uh, what you see is what you, what you get is uh it's indeed what's uh 
what's happened. And it is quite, uh, as you say, it's heartbreaking and uplifting all at the, at the same time. So, um, so thank you. Um, um, I think we're, we're starting to come towards the end of our time together, uh, Matthew, but I just want to ask you a few more questions, if I may. Um, um, besides, I, I just watching the film and uh, having seen the credits, um, I mean, besides the heroes you document and many other uh, people you give thanks and acknowledgements to, um, there's also a few, I, I only watched it through the credits once, but there's quite a list of who's who of people that you acknowledge in there as well. I think, uh, I think, Chris Hegedus and Stanley Tucci, and I think Alex Gibney, am I right? Is he an executive producer uh, on this? Um, do you want to say, could you say a few things about how they've uh, helped out with this film and uh, what, what debt of gratitude you, you owe them? Yeah, I mean, enormous. This film was an absolute um, massive collaboration between a lot of, you know, really smart, dedicated filmmakers. Uh, you know, Alex was on board officially as an EP and, and did so much to help get this film off the ground and provided, you know, feedback along the way. And I owe so much to him. You know, Chris is a, is a dear friend and provided, you know, numerous rounds of notes and watched a bunch of different cuts, um, you know, and as did a lot of people, you know, and, and I, I, I like to overscreen my film to the chagrin of my editors that, mm. uh, and, and so, you know, we, yeah, we screened this film for lots of different people and got, you know, feedback from friends, from, from you know, focus groups that we pulled together from around the country. Um, I really wanted to see how this film was impacting people emotionally and viscerally. Mm. Um, every single frame, every single moment, every single sound, every single pixel was deliberated on, was argued about, was contemplated. Mm. Um, you know, I think we, not to sound self-important, but I think we knew that the access we had was unique. And we knew that this would be one of the documents, historical documents of this time. Right. And, 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 I, and I and we felt an enormous weight uh, with that, an enormous pressure with that. And so I, I didn't want to screw it up. I didn't want to get it wrong. Um, right. And I wanted to do the best job we could um, to create this historical document. And is that an approach you take to all your films, all your documentaries, pretty much? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. I, I'm, I'm very detail oriented. Uh, I, I work really hard. I think I, I push people really hard. Um, <laughs> but I, and I'm, and I feel really lucky to do what I do. I feel mm. um, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be able to tell stories. Uh, but I think this film, more than ever, um, is the film that I'm most proud of, and it's the film that I mm. felt, yeah, the deepest responsibility with, just because yeah. it's something that's affected every single human being on this earth. And, yeah, exactly. You know, we've all been changed forever by it, and, and mm. so I wanted to, yeah, get it right. Mm. And um, And what's next for you? You've had amazing success with both documentary and narrative um, uh, I know you did Private War and that won many acclaims and awards. Uh, but what's what's next on for you if you can't even look ahead uh, uh, beyond this film? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope to keep telling stories. That, you know, yeah. um, I'm I was in Afghanistan this past summer. Um, I'm, I'm making a doc about the end of the war. Okay. Um, and I have a few uh, fiction projects that I'm working on too, and. Yeah, just excited to keep uh, telling stories as the sun mm. reflecting on the <laughs> as, as it was cued. Uh, I think, um, no, and I hope you don't mind us. I mean, I've obviously, in, it's been a pleasure having you on, and we've the discussion's been more focused in some ways, I think, as you notice, uh, on the filming filmmaking of this, and that's part of what we do here in the podcast. But I, it's not because I want to... Um, make light or didn't want to discuss the the subject matter i think it's it's one of those films where i think it's not that it should be unsaid but i, I just think people need to see it and uh, we don't you know uh, i think that's the best way to uh to highlight this film for our listeners is just to say do go see it or wherever you can because i think it's uh 
um, for me personally, is an amazing piece of filmmaking, and I think it's uh, um, it achieves a, a lot of what you said you were hoping to achieve with this film. So, uh, Matthew, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, the film is the first wave. Uh, it's been released theatrically, and it's uh, you can find it on Hulu in the states, and I know uh, it's on Disney Plus and other places, including the here in the UK where we are based. So, Matthew, thank you again for uh, for joining us. We'd love to have you again sometime. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time. I'd also like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe at Inner Sound Audio in Eskrick, England. A big thanks to Nevena Paunovich, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such great guests onto the show. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America. Signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.